back to the book of Acts. We're going to continue in the ninth verse, though we need to go back briefly uh, just for continuity's sake. Paul and his ministry group were led by the Holy Spirit, of course, or should I say, not only led, but sent forth by the Holy Spirit um, to Seleucia, and then from that point they went to, uh, to Cyprus. And verse 5 says that when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John, which is John Mark, as we'll see later, um, to their minister or to be their, their servant. Verse 6 reminds us that when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, and a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, meaning the son of Jesus. Incredible that a man would even do that in, in, excuse me, in Paul's age, but there's a lot of people that are doing far worse uh, uh, in our age. And he was with, verse 7, the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So here the deputy wanted to hear the word of God, and of course Mr. False Prophet is doing all that he can to dissuade um, the deputy from hearing to the point where he is actually openly opposing Paul and his ministry team. Not a good idea, as we'll see again in verse 9. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, notice again this terminology, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. So this is the first time I believe that we see Saul's name change to Paul. It doesn't give us any reason why. Um, I would imagine that uh, the saints did that, or he did it himself, maybe in conjunction with the saints to identify with the saints and maybe in a way to distance himself from the life that he was known for. Uh, but my point in verse 9, where I placed a lot of emphasis last time, was to look at the fact that the uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit, especially in the book of Acts, whether you're talking filling, leading, etc., is always associated with some powerful event of preaching, rebuking, miracles, etc. Being filled with the Spirit of God is not something to be compared with putting on a pair of socks in the morning. This is the kind of commonality that's being projected with the Spirit of God, is that, that it's not really that a significant issue. <laughs> And I find that among people who clearly are confused about the work of the Spirit of God, and I even find it far worse among what I call the smart guys who should know better, because it's there. It's clearly there, and if, that, if they were that smart, uh, they would see it. And, and I do want to make mention of one. I won't give his name, but he's very well known within the evangelical ranks, um, president of a seminary, Bible college, etc., and he has made it very public on a number of occasions saying he didn't know what it meant to be led by the Spirit of God. Now, that should surprise a lot of people. In fact, it should terrorize a lot of people because Paul clearly stated in Romans 8 that if any is not led by the Spirit of God, he is not a child of God. So when a man publicly declares he doesn't know what it means to be led by the Spirit of God, and Paul says, if any man isn't led by the Spirit of God, he, he's not a child of God, uh, who are you going to believe? The smart guy or Paul, the writer of Scripture? Uh, I'm going to believe what Paul said. And this wasn't the only time this man said it. He said on numerous occasions that he didn't know what it meant to be led by the Spirit of God. He just doesn't know. I don't know why anyone's listening to this guy. I don't know why anyone's going to his college or seminary. They might be really like the fact that he's smart. But when a man tells you he doesn't know what it means to be led by the Spirit, that should be an absolute red flag, warning sign, 
sirens blasting in your mind. He's telling you that he's not a believer. That's exactly what he's saying. No matter how smart he may be, if a guy's saying, I don't know what it means to be loved by the Spirit, you should be terrified at that. Absolutely terrified at it. And said it on a number of occasions. Even recently, as a matter of fact, said it again. Has no idea. He, he said, I have no idea what it means. I don't know how you can't. I mean, how smart do you have to be to ignore what it means to be led by the Spirit? I would suggest he just keep going back to the Bible until he just sees the examples and then see if his life matches that or his belief system rather than just being smart. And so my thought was, again, that every time you see that expression in the book of Acts, it's associated with some powerful event. And we looked at Acts chapter 2, 4. Chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. Chapter 6, 1 through 5. Chapter 7, 51 through 60. Chapter 9, verses 17 through 19. Chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. Chapter 11, which is where we're going to turn today. Chapter 11, uh, verses 15 through 18. And then 21 through 25. And then chapter 13 verses 49 through 52. So there, there isn't this commonality with the Spirit of God where a work of God can happen to you and it's, eh, no bigs. I'm smart. <laughs> well, you're not that smart, trust me. Acts 11, verse 15. Incredible. As, it began, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning, then I remembered uh, the word of the Lord, how that he said, John, indeed, baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. That's again, and that, as we saw, is a work of the Spirit of God too, and it is seen as salvation. The idea that there is no repentance is a statement that needs to be repented of. And those who believe it need to repent and believe the gospel. Verse 21, same chapter. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added to the Lord. You get the impression that, I'll say it this, it was common, you see in Scripture, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It, it, but it didn't affect them in a common, boring way, as if it was not that significant. Because you see these men on the pages of Scripture, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they're not the same as they were before. These are powerfully men. He was full of the Holy Ghost. It, it seemed to be something that was the pattern of, of this man's life, of Barnabas' life. It's incredible to me. Full of the Holy Ghost, and implied full of faith, just like Stephen, and much people was added unto the Lord. Here's a man whose life was so powerful that many were coming to the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to uh, Tarsus for to seek Saul. Then the last reference is in Acts chapter 13, verses 49 through 52. And, and you see again the word of the Lord associated with the Spirit of God all the time. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of, out of their coast. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Once again, we see the prominence of the Holy Spirit in the work of the believers. And there's no craziness, there's no slap happiness, there's no silliness going on with the work of the Spirit of God. 
as it is today and, and so much that is called his work which is nonsense it doesn't have a biblical model now in all of these passages which we've read uh, today and last time and the passage that we're considering in our study we see that the filling of the Holy Spirit was always associated with a significant event in Scripture. Every time you see that reference, that's true. But today, whenever you hear many teach about the filling of the Spirit or anything relative to the Spirit of God, these passages are mysteriously left out of the discussion. And you cannot, in all fairness, have a proper view of what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God if we are to leave these passages out of the equation. I mean... You're looking at what the Bible actually teaches pertaining to what will happen when a person or people are filled or led or directed by the Spirit or guided by the Spirit. And so, one of the things I've always said about people that don't want to do exposition is they're afraid that what they've been teaching people is going to be questioned and challenged by the Word, as it should be. And they will have to go back and make all these corrections. You know, once you expound upon the scripture, you get an understanding of what these writers say without any hesitation. Oh, that's what he meant. But if you're just listening to some dude or dudes and they're just teaching you whatever and there is no continuity with scripture and you don't study it or you think you have to worship these guys that you can't say anything to them that they're beyond correction, then they're just going to teach you whatever they teach you and that's what you're going to be following. But the Bible's clear what happens when a person is filled or being led by the Spirit of God. Period. So you can't dismiss all the book of Acts, like so many do, and uh, talk about the Holy Spirit. It's ridiculous. He's, he's prominent in the whole book. How in the world can you not see his hand in the church? His hand helps start the thing. It's amazing. It is very clear that when a person is filled with the Spirit of God, something significant happens in that person's life. And that this filling is not to be treated as some common thing or some insignificant thing in our lives. God's Spirit filling a believer is a powerful work. It most certainly is. His Spirit is to do more than influence us. He is to empower and lead you and me unbelievable nonsense that today we don't think we need to be led we don't think we need to be led by the Spirit of God unbelievable nonsense and I keep repeating a, a truth over and over and over again and I, I continue to plan to keep it keep repeating it and no one seems to want to answer the question or no one wants to seem to address um, what I've been um, saying uh, all these years uh, pertains to what Paul said in Romans, uh, Romans chapter 8 in particular, um, in, in verse 9, if you're, you're not uh, in the flesh but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you, uh, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I mean, what do you do with that? If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Period. Or verse 14, even more prominent. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And, and the fact is, language notwithstanding, um, and I keep asking these people, I want you to tell me what a passive verb means. Can you tell me what a passive verb means in English? The action, correct, and it's the same in the Greek language. The action is being done to you. When Paul said, as many as are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, that's a passive verb. So God is leading, the Spirit is leading you. You're not leading the Spirit, the Spirit is leading you. As many as are being led by, the source of the leading is the Spirit of God. The means of the leading is the Spirit of God. It's a passive verb. The action is done to you. It's not what you're doing to Him. And today we have it in reverse. We're acting like we're guiding the Holy Spirit. And we're just coming and getting Him when we need Him, which is utter ridiculous nonsense. And the Bible doesn't say that. 
that you get to lead anything. But no one seems to want to address it. That's fine. It's still there. You can hide all you want. And a lot of smart guys, they don't want to touch that. Because that is so simple to understand. If you're being led by the Spirit of God, you're a child of God. It's habitual in your life to be led by the Spirit. The work of God is being done to you by the Spirit of God. There's nothing you conjure up. But you can't convince them of that because they're too smart. And if you don't if you if you don't agree with their smartness, well, you know, you're a dweeb, so what does it matter? Well, it matters according to what the Bible says. And that's all that matters. The Spirit of God, again, is to do more than influence. He is to empower and to lead us, more specifically, to do His work. He is to control us. Do you understand the Spirit of God is to control us? We think that we are are the masters of our destiny. And when we need help to help our smartness, then we call upon the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I need to know whether to go down road A or B, so... Lord, please give me direction. That's, that's what we do. Lord, I need to know, is this the right person or that the right person? Is this the right job or this the right job? Is this the right church or that right church? Show me that in the Bible. You ever see that happening? I don't see it. I see Paul's going here. Spirit of God says no. He says, okay, I'm going here. No. He's going this way. Spirit of God says no. Macedonia. Doors open. He perceived the Lord did it. Why? Because he did. He's not stopping waiting to do anything. He's constantly in motion, constantly being led by the Spirit, constantly trusting and depending upon the Spirit's work. Because as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. It should be a expected thing to be led by the Spirit of God, but not today because everyone's smart. Now we we tell the Holy Ghost what we want to do. No, you don't. You're deceived. He is to influence and control us. Why are we thinking we're controlling him when the Bible's clear that he is controlling us? Ephesians 5.18 And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Now I know what this means by way of experience. But just, again, just asking, what is the significance about Paul talking about wine and being in excess? What's the significance of that in regards to this verse? You're not going to be in the spirit if you're impaired with alcohol. What was that last part again? Because you you should have flipped it. Stop, 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 stop. The only, the, the question I was asking was, what does... The first portion of that verse have to do. What and what was your answer again? My original answer was if you're impaired with alcohol, you have to be with your spirit. Okay, impaired. Define impaired. Um not thinking clearly. Not conscious, not as conscious as you should be. Keep going. Um, I'm looking for something. And you can jump in any time you want. Anyone can jump in. You're almost giving symptoms of it. Symptoms of being under the influence. The word is influence. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. In other words, when you're filled with the wine, you're under the control of the wine. Trust me, I knew that from experience. When I was under the fill in the blank, I was in control of the blank. Um, There were things you would never say when you were, were sober that you felt empowered to say when you were drunk. And if you need an example, just watch any episode of Jail. Watch any episode of Jail, and you see it every week. People come in, and they're saying the nastiest, and they're fighting and spitting at people. They put them in the tank for like four hours later, they're the nicest people on earth, and they don't even remember what they say. I saw an episode where this guy was, he lost his mind. He lost his mind completely. And he was doing this. I said, I don't care when this guy gets sober. There's never going to. He got sober and he was the exact opposite. He was apologizing to everybody. He said, I don't remember any of that. He was as nice as he could be. But he was under the dominion and the influence of the alcohol. It controlled him. Listen, it empowered him. 
This excess of drink empowered him. People get into car wrecks. They don't even get hurt. Why? They're drunk. They wrap around steering wheels, go through the dashboard, flop the back seat, don't even get a scratch. They're completely under the power of the liquor. We are to be completely under the power of the Holy Spirit. Why is that an issue? And then he tells us how that's applied into work life, into the home life, into every life. And where, where there's violations of the, of the application of the life to the Spirit, well, we're not walking in the Spirit. It's that simple. There's no, there's no confusion about this. I don't care how smart you are. You're not that smart. I don't care how much Bible you know or think you know. I don't care how long you've been in anybody's church or churches. If you can't figure out the simplicity of this, you got a big problem. There's a big, giant, empty space in your smart suitcase in your head that needs to be filled. So everything else that's in your head makes sense. Under the dominion of the Spirit of God. And when you're under the dominion of the Spirit of God, what's going to happen? Wives submit to your husbands. Husbands love your wives. Children obey your parents. Be great at your work. All this is, is outlined right there in Ephesians 5. If you're under the influence, you're going to live a life that's dominated by the Spirit of God. It's that simple. So simple, yet we're so smart, who is it went off my head? No, it didn't. It slapped you, but you didn't pay any attention to it, because it's right there. It is literally to be translated, Ephesians 5.18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be being filled with the Spirit. Be being filled. In other words, there shouldn't be a time where that's not happening. This command is from a present passive imperative verb, meaning it ain't optional. It's passive meaning what? God has to accomplish it, and he will do it. The filling of the Spirit of God is not a human work. That's what that means. Be being filled with the Spirit. Well, you can't do it. All we need to do is yield to Him. We, we can't. There's nothing in us to do it. Nothing in us to want to do it. There's nothing in us that we can do to do it. It's not a human work. You can't do it. You can't feel yourself. You cannot do anything of yourself to accomplish this work. It is completely a work of God. And I know I say that and people, they just, they ignore it and put the Rolodex back in. Blah, blah, blah. Well, Dr. so and I don't care what Dr. So-and-so said. What does that mean to me? What, frankly, what does it mean to you except an excuse? It's what the Bible says. It's not what Dr. So-and-so says. It's not what this man says. This is what the Bible says. I, I really don't care about what Dr. So-and-so says. I don't care about it. If what Dr. So-and-so is saying is contrary to what Jesus says, I'm not listening to Dr. So-and-so except to warn people you shouldn't pay attention to anybody who doesn't get this simplicity. It's a present tense verb meaning also that it's an ongoing process. The Spirit of God is, is filling up, so be, be filled with them. Something new about that. How does this verse of Scripture tie into what you have already taught about the filling of the Spirit being associated with significant events of Scripture? I already told you, the ongoing present filling of the Spirit of God is to be so significant in the church today and in individual lives of the believers that we and the lost world should see the supernatural power of the Spirit of God clearly at work in the church and the people. The influence, the work, the leading of God's Spirit upon His people should be so evident that no one should ever question our profession. Every time you see the Spirit of God working in the church, there's something great and powerful going on. What do we see today? Man, Man, all his works, all his schemes, all his plans, all his dreams, all his whatever. And relying so much on man, it's a man's plan. It's a man, it, I hate to say it, it's a man's world. That's what it is in the church. It's a man's world. It's all flesh. No one is saying this stuff. I wonder who's out there. This stuff is so clear. When it's this clear, I'm wondering, what is happening? The Spirit of God should be so empowering in the lives of the people, we should be automatically forever obedient to God's plan everywhere.
we should be the most prominent people wherever we are at because we're known for being obedient to God. The filling of the Holy Spirit should be so evident in our lives that we desire nothing else but His filling, but His leading. Period. I don't understand why that's an issue. But in today's smug, unbelieving church, that truth is going to be hard to proclaim. Yet, by simple observation, it is clear that we are anything but being filled with the Spirit. As we continue to reject any and all supernatural work of God in our lives and through our lives, it's just not true. So there's only one alternative. We're not working in conjunction with the plan of God. Every time you see, filled with the Spirit, led by the Spirit, Spirit speaks, whatever. Whatever work He's doing is something significant. Yet we keep, we keep receiving and promoting a man's plan, a man's effort, a man's work. And we're content. You know why? Because it's, it's flesh. It's, it's, hey, if, if I latch my caboose onto Dr. So-and-so's plan, Dr. So-and-so, Dr. Man so-and-so's plan, he's done all the work for me. I'm just latching onto his train. I'll need to study. I'll need to be led. I'll need to be, I, my, my train is full. It's full of him. I don't need God. What do I need him for? I just need God to lead me when I need something. Show me that in the Bible. I dare you to show me that anywhere near a Bible. Where you or I or anybody in Scripture waited until they needed something and then said, God, I want you to lead me by your Spirit and show me. Just take a New Testament, any book in New Testament, from Acts on and show it to me. In fact, I'll go Luke on and show it to me. Go ahead, Daniel. You show me today the behavior of people talking about the Holy Spirit and tell me where's the consistency of that in Scripture. I dare you to do it. Dare you to do it. Challenge you. Challenge you to do it. You're not going to do it, but you should. Because you're going to lose. Every time. Because it's not there. Verse 9, Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Man! He didn't waste his time thinking today, well, you can't, you know, that would be so unloving and unchristlike. Shut up! What the world you know about Christ-like and Jesus turn over tables, fool! He beat people with the whip, all that were false, threw them out of the temple. He said, don't you dare turn my father's house into a shopping center. That's what he said. It's a house of prayer. Get all this junk out my father's. They turned they turn the temple into a mall. And he emptied the mall out. Threw money, everything all over. I can animal ran running out of the temple. Men too, he beat them with a whip. <laughs> what we did, what we would do is after he left, take the money back, put it back in the temple. Paul was not concerned about that. He looked and said, oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief. He says, you are filled to the full with all kinds of deceit and guile, as well as being filled with all kinds of cunning. So we see this man, this man who was a deceiver and a cunning man, and a lot of them are. But they're not as cunning to those who are filled with the Spirit. They're cunning to the gullible. See, the fact is that Sergius was a, a prudent man, he was a wise man, but he was easily gullible to the wiles of Bar-Jesus. It's also important to note here that Elymas enjoyed some sort of profligate lifestyle. <laughs> the word mischief speaks of one who loves a lazy, effeminate life and who was a man without scruples. That'd be true of a lot of them today. That'd be true of all of them today. Did I miss something? Okay, I'm thinking, what did no, I say? You're good, you're good. Okay, good, thank you. I'm like, good, good talking. What the world I, okay, anyway. <laughs> um, the word also speaks of one who can easily deceive others. If you're easily deceivable, if you're gullible, there, there, there are people coming, and they will get you. You have to be wise and learn to say, 
you're a liar. Let him know. His livelihood was at stake here, and that's one reason why he was so livid at Barnabas and Paul. Oh, no, you don't. Uh -uh, I'm, I'm living a good life here. Uh -uh, we can't have you. Uh, what do you... What do you? He tried with, with all of his might to make the gospel a, disgu a disgusting thing, and probably these apostles a disgusting thing in the minds and the heart of the governor, but for his own interest, not for the good of the governor. False teachers don't care about anybody. Anyone false cares about themselves. This evil man exercised sorcery and power by the help and control of demons, which had led him into all kinds of deception of others and distortions of the truth. I mean, he called himself the son of Jesus. Give me a break. The occult is indeed a dangerous, a dangerous art and from the devil. Just as a side note here, this verse should end any discussion about psychic lines, horoscopes, and the like. These are all works of the devil, and any professing Christian getting involved in these things is getting involved in the works of the devil for his or her own life, which in turn will affect the lives of those around you. Trust me, I saw it in my own home growing up. When black magic was being practiced by my father, it affected the household, literally. Now, people dismiss it. I don't care if you dismiss it. I really don't care. I've seen these things, and those who live there have seen things with their own eyes. Demonic things that were going on in the house after dad had long died. You don't invite demons in the house through the means of black magic or other means, and expect them to go away. I've heard and seen things in that house like, I'm glad I'm not there. Learn a lesson about false teachers. They get livid and attack the credibility of the messenger and the message of God, not because they care for the people they deceive, but to continue in their profligate lifestyle. And they do this. Yeah, I mean, you see all of them do it. I don't care. Name any one of them. I mean, when I saw Paul Crouch call himself a God, and no one, no one rebuked him for that, I saw, and he just began, all you people, critics, be gone. Him, his wife, and the, the absolute reprobate of all time, Kenneth Copeland, and his wife, claiming to be a God. And no one said anything. They just, well, you know. No, I don't. Well, you know. <laughs> then it just showed me again that big likes big. See, there's a, listen, there's a public image with prominent ministers, and there's a private image with prominent ministers. And you'd be surprised that private image is. You say, wait a minute, so and so's with who? Mm hmm. Big goes to big. You'd be surprised who some of your so called famous evangelical Bible teachers hobnob with when you ain't looking. You find them in certain conferences. You find some of these out there playing golf. He's playing golf with who? Mm -hmm. I ain't going to tell you. You know why I ain't going to tell you? Because you ain't going to believe it anyway. So why should I waste my time? Number two, he said, you child of the devil. There's no question about that. But there are many today who fulfill what we have examined so far, who qualify as a child of the devil because of their desire to live a soft and profligate lifestyle at the expense of truth. And who make the gospel of Christ a disgusting thing in the minds and the hearts of many who, who may even desire to hear it. These evil men should be soundly rebuked by those claiming to have and who claim are being led by the Holy Spirit who say nothing at all or nothing about these men. They just don't say anything. They're quiet. I, I don't want to start no mess seeing I'm, I'm living my profligate lifestyle. I don't want something to interfere with my stuff. You my wife, I got to please my wife. She's got to be happy. I'm following her. That's what you're saying. I, I, I can't, I can't, I, I can't let none of them said that. Mm -hmm, go ahead. To hell shall you go.
In Aramaic, Bar Jesus means son of Jesus. Paul told him that instead of being a son of Jesus, Jesus means Yahweh is salvation. Elimus was a child, literally son of the devil. He called him a son of the devil, a child of the devil. He's calling himself the son of Jesus. And Paul said, you're the son of Satan. Elimus was a child of the slanderer, a child of the greatest false accuser ever, Satan, and so is any man, regardless of their rank or platform, in this day or any day or in any age, who do the things that Elimus did in his life. He said, you're not a child of, you're not the son of Jesus, you're the son of the devil. And what else did he say about him? You're an enemy of all righteousness. Wow. Whatever Jesus was or is, this man was the exact opposite. He was hateful, hostile, and opposed to everything that was righteous, be it the truth or the true and living God. I mean, to call yourself the son of Jesus. Wow. That took a lot of, lot of guts and a lot of demons to do that. I mean, that's the ultimate blasphemy. The false whatever is not ashamed to be associated with our pure and lovely Lord Jesus. But this man was opposed to everything and anything that was righteous. And so is every false teacher in any age. But we don't seem to get that. In fact, I find people defending them. Said, don't ever talk to me. <laughs> if you're defending evil, you're evil. I don't want anything to do with you. It astonishes me that so many of these self and church appointed evangelical leaders, so called, are willingly deceiving the masses by being tolerant of those who are enemies of all righteousness. I told you, I've seen and heard of these people, they're all playing golf. People, <laughs> that time, I learned something. Sometimes you, you, you go in a place and you learn something. And you file it. You put it away. You, you kind of look and you see certain things now, but you put it away and you file it for future use. I remember when that first horrible movie came out, The Temptation of Christ. William De Will Defoe played that nonsense piece of trash. And the Christian community rose up against it, protested. I was there. I was, I'm sitting in the house minding my business. I'm being, I was called to come and to be a part of this. I was on radio. They asked me to come. I said, okay. I didn't know who was going to be there until I got there. Boy, did I learn something. Every false teacher and everybody except a few of the true ones had nothing to do with it. But all the, all the radio heads were there. And I was sitting in the car... With the, I was asked by Jane Chastain to sit in the car with her and with a, it was a big car, a bunch of us were in the car. And I'm looking at all these people like, heretic, heretic, false teacher, true teacher. Why are these people the same? And you get out there and they're all there. It's like this hodgepodge of religion, heresy and evangelicalism, and, they're all, and, and word faith and, and all the TV, and, and they're all there. Busting in all these people. I'm just thinking about this. Filing this, thinking about it. This is interesting. And I got to meet some of the people on Channel 5. You know, they were very gracious and what have you. I just thought about this. What is all this? I, I regret it going. Because I saw what I was looking at. Going, what? What is this person? And this person? And this person? And big goes to big. That was the lesson. That was the lesson, sure enough. Big goes to big. They were all, they're all together no matter what they tell you, apart from the pulpits and the programs, they're all to, they all hobnob together for their common cause. And I'm saying, wow. This is, I'm sitting there just doing like this. Because people wonder, who is he? <laughs> In the car, they go, who's, who's this black guy? I said, I'm just, I'm along for the ride. I was asked to come here. By who? By so-and-so. Oh, okay. And Jane is yapping, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, 
I don't even know who you are. <laughs> you just yammer like we know each other. I don't know you. And here's the irony. I took hundreds of photos of the event. And they said, we would like to borrow your photos, you know, and we'll get them back to you. They stole my photos. I haven't seen them to this day. They stole every one of them. These are Christians. These are professing Christians that are professing thieves. That's what they are. And I called the organization time and time and time again, wanting my photos, and they stopped returning my calls. I said, that's okay. Big goes to big. They don't care about you. I said, okay. I learned a valuable lesson then, too. Get your own photos. <laughs> okay. What I take is my own. I can, no. No, we can't. I don't know you. Get your own photographs. And so people would ask me for, no. What about, no. I said, they stole my photos. You were there, and you were there, and you were there, and you said nothing about it, and you got more clout than I do? No. Get your own stuff. So there are times I had to say no to people. So it made me, I guess, they put me on a list. I put it back on a list. I, I don't care. Keep me there. you bunch of thieves. In the name of the Lord. Big goes to big. It really... I, I guess it shouldn't astonish me at all that so many of these self-appointed leaders really just are so tolerant and they hang out they hang out together. You see them fight each other over pulpits, but they play golf together. Someone told me that this well-known evangelical play golf with all these false teachers. I just started laughing. I started laughing. I said, "So what else is new? They've been doing it forever." He told us. Mm -hmm. But I want to put the blame where the blame belongs. It, it belongs to the masses of people who are content to do as little study as possible in the Word and they live their lives, their so-called spiritual lives, on their mobile devices, maybe radio. I don't know, radio is kind of out now, so it's all the mobile stuff now. Anyone has a radio? I don't have a, I have one, but I don't use it. If I did, it would be to listen to what's going on in the radio at the front office and have a little transistor radio in the back, so we use the old radios. No need to do anything else. It still works. The one speaker works. I'm going to get me another speaker. But um, today, most professing believers are living their so-called spiritual life, and they associate spirituality, undefined that is, as being that which is Christian. Spirituality, it's never defined because you can't define it. Spirituality means... A million different things to a million different people. But people who are supposedly spiritual or who go through this spirituality nonsense, well, I'm a Christian. How did you determine it? Because I'm a spiritual person. Define that. Well, I don't, well, I don't, what does that mean? See, I always, I want them to first trap themselves in their own stupidity and then say, but Christianity is defined by the scripture. Do you get that? So you just, you know, go, go, depends, wherever trail they, they go to. Okay, you're a spirit. What does that mean? Let them define their terms. Don't assume anything. Let them define what they mean. One person can say what well, spirituality means, and I go to church, someone might say spirituality means I worship Satan. So you have to figure out, if a person is saying that, what do they mean? And I like to ask, well, what does that mean? What do you mean by that? Define that, please. Help me understand what you're saying. And then when they finish destroying themselves, where is that in the Bible? The Bible says Christianity is this. So you get Christianity is defined from Scripture, not from this vague spirituality. So today everyone is spiritual, which means absolutely nothing. Because it's never defined by anybody. And if they do, it's so hodgepodge of mishmash, you would have regretted even asking the question. But I blame the mass of church people. It's the church people's fault. It's not the, listen, the false teacher says, hey, I'm a false teacher. Today they go, hey, I'm false, I'm going to deceive everybody, give me money. Okay, and they do it. <laughs> Why? Because it, the, the culture that we have had since I was a Christian in the 70s, we didn't raise people on scripture. It, it started to die, really, the late 70s, beginning of the 80s. 
And I found that movement nonsense came to pass and ch charismatic nonsense followed soon after. The next position was being tossed out the window with something boring. So we need something exciting and new. So yeah, let's let's let, let's get a lot of humanism and mysticism in the church. That that's really new. And so we stopped teaching the word of God. And people that used to teach the word of God became mysticists and just tried to get people. They figured I can't win by being an exposer. And I don't want to outright deny what I supposedly believe and be a crazy person. So let me just do both. And I can get both both groups. And then we start having multiple services. Oh, so if you like jazz in the first service, you can have that. If you like traditional music in the second service, you can have that. If you like hip-hop in the third service. So they started making services devoted to the lust of the people. So now if you want... I, I know one so-called church has six services. The emphasis of the service is on the liturgy and what people want rather than the Word of God. And God didn't bless it. They had all kinds of problems and still do. Because God ain't into none of that stuff. We don't need the Spirit of God. We're too smart. We got a lot of guys that can do so many things. What do we need the Spirit of God for? So they learn what they claim to be spirituality or spiritual things, not from the Bible, but from their various and confusing versions of Christian stew pumped in through their minds by everyone that's false. And they try to get one or two that are true and everyone else is false and none of it comes from any diligent study of the Word of God. Uh, and they don't want to be taught by the Spirit, of course, because that puts you back in the Word and back in God's plan. So I'll say it again. Radio doesn't make you right, TV doesn't make you theological, books don't make you biblical, and seminary doesn't make you sound. Doesn't make you smart either, by the way. Because you can do any or all of these things apart from your own personal study and holiness, or because you are the leader and doer of these things means nothing as far as who you are is concerned. And I've seen people do all this, and they're no, no longer in anybody's ministry or church. It's like that time I had preached many years ago at uh, one of the Calvary Chapel events way up in the mountains. Hated that. Hate going up to the mountains. And they probably knew it. I think it was the next to the last time before I went. And that was the time that the I think the cry was scheduled to play and I said the word of God is more important. You guys played all this music so now you took up all my time. You think I'm one of the 15 minute preachers. You got the wrong guy. And so I just preached an hour. The cry never played. I guess Others were crying about it, and so I spent time talking to people who were, you know, supposedly wanted to know something about Jesus when they come to the Lord. And this so-called worship leader was complaining that uh, I was doing that, and that uh, she was complaining, didn't like it, like expressed her disappointment, blah, blah, blah. I said, you have people coming to know the Lord. And who is this fool? Because I think Brian had told me, I said, who is this fool who's complaining? We've got people coming to know Christ. Isn't that what this is supposed to be about? I don't care about some band. I care about soul. And I told him, she needs to be careful about that attitude because God's not pleased with that. <laughs> the next time I talked to Brian, about six months later, she had left the church, was having prostitution. I said, see, don't be playing with that stuff. You don't, you don't start doing stuff like that because... God ain't pleased with that. That's not good. Says so she went back on drugs and he should have shut him out. Here people are coming to hear the word of God. They're being saved. Or at least they're making professions of salvation. And here this fool comes along. Well, you know, he shouldn't have done this. But okay. I've said this before. And I'll say it again. And it's happened time and time and time and time and time again. To be dismissed as some kind of fluke I've warned people in the past I do it now I don't know what it is about the Lord he, he's just I, I even hate to say it because I'm going to be misunderstood but I'm going to say it anyway even, even at the probability of being misunderstood I tell people do not mess with me it does, it does not bode well for you I've had this happen for many, many years, when people, they come against me, it doesn't bode well for them. And I'm not instigating anything. I'm not saying it's because I'm some special whatever. But clearly the Lord has 
blessed my life in such a way that people who come against it, it doesn't bode well for them. And it's happened time and time again. People have, under one guy, I remember I was just newly saved, and this guy would rag on about the faith and Christianity, then he decided to rag on me. And I was a brand new convert, probably, let's see, maybe two, three months old. And it was on a Saturday that we, I'll never forget, I was working security on the Saturday. And he was just ragging on about, and you this and you that. I said, God will kill you if you mock him. I don't believe that. I said, you need to stop that. Stop doing that. That next day, he wrapped his car around a tree. He lived. He came in. Next time I saw him, about two weeks later, he was so nice to me. I said, I told you, don't be playing with God like that. And don't come against me like that. He treated me so nice. Oh, my, you, you thought we were the bosom buddy, lifelong friends. I said, I just, I just don't, don't do it. Just don't do it. And I was very cordial to him after that. He heard the gospel then. He wasn't hostile to that. This happened time and time and time and time and time again. If you don't want to hear the truth from, from me, that's fine. I got nothing to, you know, do your thing. Just walk away. But the minute you start going hardly this, hardly that, I've seen things happen to people. It's just not nice. It's not good. I wouldn't, I would and I just, I don't come against those who I know are God's men. Uh-uh, better not. Better not do that. It's not wise. Not wise. Not smart. Not smart. Do, do that to somebody else. Or if you're just daring, you want to get stupid, that's fine. Do whatever. I just think you ought to just repent, whatever. Verse, or number four, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? This man was one who made it his business by way of his lying life to distort and to cause others to turn aside from the truth. His entire life was a plot against the saving purposes and plan of God. The right ways of the Lord is right. Everything else is detrimental to the saving purposes and plan of God. Anyone who is false is not in the business of salvation but of damnation. It is completely ridiculous to think for a second that God is using a false whatever to do his work of evangelism. It is utter stupidity. It shows an absolute lack of intelligence, sense, or any spiritual reason to think that God is using some false whatever to do his work other than to judge somebody to do his work of evangelism when he says they are already damned since the beginning of time. Unbelievable. But today, doctrines and leagues are being formed between so-called evangelical leaders and heretics and false teachers. And where, may I ask, is the public voice of renunciation? Where is it at? Where is the public voice against these leagues being formed in the first place? Where is the public voice against these leagues being nothing less than the work of the devil. Who's saying that? Where are these men or women at? Where are the men filled with the Holy Ghost on radio and television who will stand in God's power and declare to the watching and listening world of stupid saints and lost souls who need to hear from God that these evil conglomerations are nothing but the work of Satan himself and against all righteousness? Where are they at? Where are they at? They are nowhere. That's where they're at. And even if you would find one, he would be the exception and not the rule. God's way is the straight way. It is the clear way with no ambiguities. God's way is righteousness. And no man without the Spirit knows God's way. Now, I don't care how smart you are, how intelligent you claim to be, and then you turn around, you deny that by your association with the very people you should be publicly renouncing. God's righteousness is clear, and his message clear, and for those who oppose it, may God judge you for your wickedness. Now look at what he said to this man, then we're done. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, 
and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Well, there you go. Now we see what the true power of God is. This man was judged by God directly and instantly. Wow. The word season refers to a limited period of time. Now what happened? Well, he was blind. That's what happened. The Holy Spirit was working through Paul and whatever he said, God said. If Paul, filled with the Spirit of God, told us, man, that he's going to be blind, be certain that he would be blind, and he was, and that immediately. He went groping and looking for someone to lead him by the hand. <laughs> well, what was the outcome? Then the deputy, verse 12, when he saw what was done, believed. Now notice carefully. Notice what he believed. Being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Didn't say anything about the miracle, but the doctrine of the Lord. Wow. There are a lot of people that downplay the judgment of God upon Elymas as being insignificant to the governor's salvation, but that would be wrong to do that. And clearly a violation of what the word states here. The text states that after what happened to Elymas, that when he was blinded, he seeing what was done, he believed, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Well, the event only drove deeper into the heart of the governor what he already heard about the Lord and evidently about his power. Again, it is this bent against the supernatural for many men today who attempt to downplay clearly what the text states here. There's no misunderstanding at all within the text. The governor heard the word of the Lord. In hearing about the Lord, he heard the gospel, and I'm sure other things about the Lord. Then Elymas attempted to turn the governor away from the gospel. God judges him after hearing Paul state that this same God they preached to the governor would blind this man for a season. After he was blinded, the governor, being a witness to all which was said and done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. He was astonished. He was like, what? Oh, I believe. Here he, he was seeing all this false, demonic nonsense. Man claiming to be Jesus. And I even suspect, you know, what he was doing was done so minimally for the governor to believe so instantly in the gospel and the power of God. I mean, this man was blinded just by what Paul was saying. Yeah, he has the power of God. You don't. I believe the gospel. He believed what he heard. He believed what he saw. Powerful. Next time we get into verse 13. And uh, this should be a very interesting chapter because it's going to be what I want to title Paul's great historical exposition on the gospel. There are a lot of people that believe that the gospel is not an historical event. Well, that's because they're stupid. <laughs> they choose not to believe the evidence. It is quite historical. You know, if, if I, I fancy myself as being somewhat smart to some point, I also believe there's a lot to learn in this life. For someone to say that Christianity is not historical and they offer no evidence of that, it's just stupidity. It's a stupid opinion. Christianity is an historical event, and Paul, in his perfect historical exposition of Jesus, takes the Jewish mind all the way back to the creation and brings them all the way back up to the point which he would bring to them in this chapter and clearly shows the plan of God and how God preserved the nation of Israel, created and preserved the nation and promised them a Messiah and he fulfilled that in Christ. Perfect historical exposition in Christ. Once again, you have to know your Bible to understand what's being said. Or else you're going to hear these other voices of stupid people and you're going to think they know something. What do they know? They know nothing. It's what you need to know and I need to know and everyone needs to know through the lifelong study of Scripture. Father, thank you again for the clear word that you have given us today. And may we believe you, believe the record, believe the report, proclaim it to others and be blessed. Thank you today. May you bless the bread and cup in Jesus' name. Amen.
what verse? Verse 12. Thank you. So this is actually 47 today. Hmm. That's right through 12, correct, thank you. 